This is the economics of. You're listening to the Georgia Tech School of Economics podcast. Each month, we'll delve into the processes behind a new topic. I think that a lot of what's going on in the world has to do with the economy. You may be Let me pay. try to put this in running personal out of money, terms. Running out, running out of money. Here is a dollar such as you earned, spent, or saved. Do you understand the difference between a commercial bank and an investment bank? Of course. Can say that. The federal budget, federal budget, federal budget economic patriots but rather we'll try to explain where we are how we got there and how we can get that the glass steagall act i'm your host tony gallego and i'm your host laura grace and today we're talking about the economics of money and cryptocurrency Our guest today is Dr. Willie Belton. Dr. Belton is an associate professor and the undergraduate program director for the School of Economics at Georgia Tech. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So I'm really excited about this topic because uh, money and crypto is becoming a very, very hot topic. Um, And, you know, on campus, we have a lot of cryptographers that probably work on this stuff. But before we get into the nuances of that, let's just sort of define what money is and what are its functions? Money is a medium of exchange, which means it's used to buy and sell and you have to exchange something. It's also a unit of account. It allows us to uh, put things in a distinct value relative to something else. So it's a unit of account. Like we don't have to worry about what what five apples are relative to four oranges Mm -hmm. because they each have a price, which means that we can just look at the price and we can tell what the relative value really is. But inherent in that, you have to say, say these four oranges are a dollar. Inherently, I have to believe that those oranges are worth the dollar. That's exactly right. But you see how it's easy to trade apples for oranges if they all have a dollar price. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to figure that out each time. Now, money is a store of value in the sense that it it holds value for a time. It's a great store of value as long as we don't have inflation. As long as prices don't rise, it's a great store of value. But money can become a lousy store of value if prices are rising. So in effect, if apples are increasing in price, the number of apples that you can get for a dollar starts to go down as prices rise, which means that it's not holding value. Bad idea. So I was reading in this macro book that money is neither income nor wealth. But if it's a store of value, why don't we think of it in terms of wealth or income? And it's mainly because Wealth is a stock and in in the sense that you can have wealth, you can have a number of bonds, a value for those bonds, and those things are in a like a, a pile, a stock of things. So money is a is a tool. It's not it's not a stock. It's a tool that you use for exchange. So wealth is very different than money. In, in the sense that you can have a pile of wealth, you can have a pile of money, but the problem with money is it's, its value can go down just as your wealth can go down, but this is something you own. Also calculated in wealth are real assets, hard assets, like you can have gold, you can have uh, uh, a building, your home is in your is in your wealth calculation. So could we say that money is a tool to acquire wealth? It's a representation. That's 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 very true. It, it can help you acquire wealth, no doubt about it. We wanted to break it down even further. When we're talking about cryptocurrency in relation to money, we want to know how can someone just make up money? Okay, so you said that money is a tool of exchange. A medium of exchange. A medium yeah. of exchange. Mm-hmm. Okay, what can be money and what can't be what's money and what's not money like what are the requirements for something that works as money convenience uh is durability not a requirement for money it is it but not one that we teach right durability you got to have a you got to have a piece of paper or something that's durable that can't be destroyed easily right for sure because 
if it, if it goes away, that's why we can't use cabbage, right? Because it'll rot. So you can't have anything that'll rot because your money would go away. But, but we use paper, right? Paper money as we do now because it's easy to carry, right? Uh, you can conceal it for all intents and purposes. Uh, it's durable. Speaking of the durability of money, according to Glamour magazine, since the 1800s, U.S. dollars have been printed on a cotton paper blend supplied by Crane. And for the longest time since the 1800s, Crane & Co. has gotten 30% of its cotton in the form of denim scraps from the garment industry. That's why when you leave a bill in your pocket, it's durable enough to withstand the rinse and spin cycles in your washing machine. Now, the reason we, ha- we make it so sophisticated is you can't duplicate it. You can't have something that people can duplicate really easily. If you've watched over, you guys are probably not old enough. I remember when the faces on the presidents on a, on a bill were small. Now they're very large. It takes up a whole bunch of space on the bill because you can put more detail in these things. So each bill, uh, a 20 or 50 or whatever, has lots of detail. So that the counterfeiters can't counterfeit the bill very easily. Let's let's suppose you had diamonds and everybody agreed that diamonds are really valuable, right? You could make diamonds money. You really could. But if the if the face value of the diamond was worth more, was worth less than the value of the diamond in some other process then people would hoard all this, all the diamonds and you wouldn't have any money circulating. So, so it's, it, you have to be very careful about what you decide to make money. Right. And if you, if you notice all of, like our pennies and our dimes, they're not even precious metals anymore. It's junk. Cause you can't do anything else with it. Like we could gather 500 quarters. If we melted them down, we couldn't sell it for anything. Right. Whereas they used to be made of silver. Yeah. If it was yeah. made of silver and we got 500 quarters and we melted them down, we'd have, let's say, three pounds of silver, which may be worth more than 500 quarters. So we've established that money can be anything that's durable, not precious, easy to carry, concealable, not easily duplicated. But can someone just decide that they're going to start their own form of money? have to have people willing to accept it. And why are they willing to accept it? Because the government guarantees the transaction. So there's another requirement. People have to be willing to accept it because their transactions are safe and guaranteed. Google's dictionary defines cryptocurrency as a digital currency in which encryption techniques are used to regulate the generation of units of currency and verify the transfer of funds, operating independently of a central bank. Decentralized cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin provide an outlet for personal wealth that is beyond restriction and confiscation. Cryptocurrency is a currency that's not controlled by any official government, right? In other words, it's not like dollars or yen or... or uh, uh, So it's totally decentralized, essentially. Total, totally decentralized. Now let's look at the way people get Bitcoins. You have the blockchain, which is a growing list of records linked using cryptography. It's designed so that the public can view it, and every piece builds on the last by means of a timestamp and recorded transaction data, so that it's incredibly resistant to modification. Theoretically, all of this makes the blockchain unhackable. So in theory, it meets some of the requirements of money as safe and guaranteed, not easily duplicated, easy to carry. Well, because you don't have to carry it since it's digital, but is it money? Cryptocurrency is sort of a misnomer. Mm-hmm. It's a currency, but it's an investment tool also. Because it's not, what happens to it is that you can produce, let, let's just say coin for, for lack of better terminology. You produce one coin of crypto. Now, in, in, in monies like a US dollar or something, it has a value that's assigned to it. That value can go up or down based on debasement, but the value of that $1 is a dollar. Crypto has an investment piece to it. So a coin can change in value based on the marketplace because as more people want crypto, 
it's not that the size of the pile is increasing. The value of each coin is increasing. This is where its investment piece comes. So you still may have, let's say you have 10 million coins, but the, each coin can now not be valued as a dollar. It can be valued as $2. So in a sense, you got 20 million worth of value. If that value rises to $3 or three, whatever, then you got 30 million. So that's the investment apparatus in, in Bitcoin, right? Because it's the, the, the value of each individual coin can rise dramatically. And even though there's been a dip, I think it peaked at about 20,000 a coin and mm -hmm. now it's back like around below 10, mm -hmm. people still ultimately think it will continue to go up. So within that, don't you have a hoarding issue and also uh, a lack of circulation issue that comes with that? Yeah, because if you think it's going to go up in value, you're not going to sell it unless somebody's willing to pay you a really high price. See, th think about this. Think about this as having a piece of paper in your hand. And today that piece of paper is worth $10,000. But somebody needs this piece of paper in order to make a transaction in another place. Now, what they'll have to offer you is what you think its value is going to be in two days or three days or however long you want to hold it. So they got to offer you a higher price if you think the price of this piece of paper is going to rise. This is a constraint because if I think it's going to rise, I want to hold it. And I only want to sell it when I think it's topped out. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if that's the case, there's a delay in the, in the purchase. Because I'm going to look at it and think, hmm, this piece of paper may be worth, it's worth 10000 a day. It may be worth 11000 tomorrow. Well, I got to get this guy to pay me at least $11,000 for it because I got to capture tomorrow's value. If I think it's going to be worth 20000 in 10 days, I'm going to hold it unless he's willing to pay me 20000 today. So it makes it very costly to obtain Bitcoin. It just depends on what people think is going to happen to the price. So is cryptocurrency money? Theoretically, <laughs> there, 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 it has aspects of money. But I always think of cryptocurrencies as an investment vehicle more than I do money. Why? Because it's not exchanged very easily, right? It's not, it's not like... You can't go to the Walmart and spend cryptocurrency. You really can't. And even if you could, why would you if you think it's going to go up? Yeah. You, you, you can't go to the Walmart and buy it. You can with dollars. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin don't exactly fit the definition or categories of traditional money. There's commodity money, which gets its value as an object with an intrinsic value in and of itself like gold. And there's fiat money, like dollars, that's made legal tender by a governmental decree. Cryptocurrency is almost a completely new thing. It's an investment vehicle to some degree. So it's almost more like an equity almost. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Because see, see, think about it. If, you hold, if you're holding Bitcoin and you think its value is going to rise, you're not, you're not thinking about it in exchange. You're thinking about it as an investment vehicle, which is, which, which is really an important notion. So... The, the the interesting part of it, the interesting part of it is that if we can come to a stable value for it, then the hoarding will disappear because everybody won't. You won't be thinking about, OK, if I sell it today, I should have held it for an extra day and I could have got more money for it the next day. If we know what the value is going to be, then people will buy and sell it because everybody will know the real price of it. That simple. Right now. The, interest, the other interesting part of Bitcoin is this. Because you can't track it, all of the criminals like it. Because by and large, you can pay me in Bitcoin. Then I can sell the Bitcoin and turn it into dollars. <laughs> now the interesting stuff. Silk Road was an online black market and the first modern darknet market, best known as a platform for selling illegal drugs. As part of the dark web, it was operated as a Tor hidden service such that online users were able to browse it anonymously and securely without potential traffic monitoring. When Silk Road was shut down in 2013, the FBI seized 144,000 bitcoins worth $28.5 million at the time. 
Even with the recent decline in the Bitcoin price, the seized Bitcoins would be worth approximately $979,200,000 today. Okay, here, here's, here, here's, here's one of the tricks, too, that could be a problem for you. Let's suppose I wanted to sell Bitcoin. I wanted to sell $10,000 worth. And you wrote me a check for $10,000. Now, I could deposit that check fairly easily, right? But there's a footprint from that check because it came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It came out of your account. Now, I could deposit it so I could use the money easily, right? But if the government really wanted to figure it out, they would say, where did Willie Belton get $10,000 from? And it came from Tony Gallego. And where did Tony get it from? But see, that money is already in the system, so there's no reason for them to track it. So in a sense, what you're doing, when I, when when you buy Bitcoin from me and give me a check, you're laundering my money. Because you just legitimized my money. Because you're going to give me a check for the Bitcoin. Now I can deposit the check in a bank and nobody's going to ask me anything. So in effect, what these guys are able to do is launder money, right? Because you got a parallel system, the Bitcoin system running alongside the monetary system, and you can go back and forth with a check from the monetary system. What would be your sort of elevator pitch of like the biggest reason why people should use crypto or why crypto might actually become a replacement for the U.S. dollar? It won't. It won't (laughs) become a replacement. But the reason, if I were a criminal, I would use crypto. Okay. I really would. Because I could then make transactions and nobody could figure out who was doing it. Especially internationally, right? Oh, God, yeah. God, yeah. But but I could make transactions in the United States and you couldn't figure out. All you have is the number. There's more to Bitcoin than just criminal investments, though. At one point, Dr. Belton implied that governments would start to regulate it. As we were producing this podcast, an article was released about how Japan's financial services agency enacted legislation to recognize Bitcoin as a legal means payment. This legislation also mandated that cryptocurrency exchanges must be registered and licensed. Other countries are beginning to do this as well. It doesn't really have an institution backing it. So your faith in it isn't like you have faith in the American dollar. No. But think about somewhere like Venezuela where monetary debasement has occurred and they don't have faith in the institution that backs their currency. And there might be... If they can get somebody to exchange their currency for crypto, they'll do it. And you would encourage that, right? You say this is the smart thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are pros to Bitcoin. Yes. Yes. I I, I didn't. I never said that Bitcoins was bad. It's just not money. That's that's what I'm saying. It's not money in the true sense. It has other attributes that are very different than just money. So anytime you're holding it, its value could go up or down. Think about think about the people who bought it at eighteen thousand per coin Mm -hmm. and when it dropped back to 10 somebody was pissed yeah because you lost eight thousand dollars a coin its value is speculative a hundred percent speculative hundred percent well maybe the optimist would say that's just a market correction well we'll see yeah we, we will well even if you just think of the proliferation of more cryptos yeah yeah and there's just a lot more of them available and people disperse among those i mean that's gonna drop the demand for it i would assume yeah yeah but it's a, it's a it's a quantity thing, right? In the sense of just had a kid write a paper with me on the number of transactions. See, it becomes attractive when there's a lot of transactions being made. If you can't get anybody making the transactions, it's not going to be attractive. So in the paper, did he stipulate a number per day, per week, per month? He was able to get the size of the new buyers. And what we So how many new buyers came in every yeah, day? Yeah, and what we saw is that as the new as new buyers came in, the volatility of the price went up. So there is no generic uh, or basic value to this. It's just it's just a pure market phenomenon or a Ponzi scheme. Call it what you want. Yeah, call it what you want.